Uh, James, find James chapter 1. James chapter 1, second message in the book of James. And uh, as I've prepared this message, I, I've been very bipolar. You know, bipolar, two, two different ends of the spectrum, excited and then not excited, the opposite of excited. What's the opposite of excited? Unexcited, depressed. Um, the reason I'm excited because I, I feel like God, you know, I, I usually begin studying whatever I'm going to preach on Sunday morning. I'll begin reading the passage and trying to formulate an outline. Usually I try to start that on Monday just to kind of let that uh, serve as a crock pot for me and, uh, and, and just kind of let it simmer and stew a bit. And so I, I got my basic kind of outline early on in the week, and I'm like, man, this is good stuff. I'm excited about this. This is great. And then about the last part of the week, God took the truth that I'm going to be preaching and applied it to me. And then I was, like, not excited, and I'm like, this stinks. I have to actually live out what I'm preaching. And if I, if I can just be honest... Uh, the latter part of my week wasn't the most enjoyable for me just internally. You know what I mean? Sometimes we have those times internally. Um, uh, just kind of a bummer, if I'm being honest. Uh, but I really feel like the timing of that, God was doing that to say, okay, I, I want you not just to be a communicator of a truth, I want you to live the truth out and let that truth, let my truth pour in and through your heart and soul so you can convey it more effectively to my people. And so we'll see how that goes uh, over the next few moments. Okay, so this is the second message. And last week, remember what we did is we looked at the shocking introduction that James gave us in just verse number one. We only looked at one verse. This is going to take us a long time. If we, now, today we're going to knock out about three verses. But if we only knock out one verse a message, gracious, Jesus will come back before we finish this book. Uh, but, but James gave us this shocking introduction um, as he introduced himself as the author of the book. Remember, he introduced himself, look, I'm a bond slave. I, I'm not just someone who who got into financial distress and then had to become a slave. By the way, a slave in the Bible isn't the same as a uh, as slave that we knew in America. Very different, very different. I don't have time to explain that. But, but the slave that he's referring to is not someone that uh, gets in financial distress, can't pay their debts, and so they have to go work for the person that they owe the debt for, which was which was actually benevolent back then. It was God's form of welfare to take care of someone that uh, was in financial need. This particular term that James uses to describe himself was one who not goes into slavery because of financial distress, but is born into slavery. The reason that that identification is so shocking is because he didn't always have that identity. Remember, we, we looked at the history of James that, that uh, he wouldn't, he, like most younger brothers, he wasn't a big fan of his big brother, Jesus. And he had dishonor and even disdain for his big brother. And so when he introduces himself and calls Jesus Lord, you're like, whoa, something happened to James. And so we looked at that last week. Then he's going to start off his epistle, and he's going to obviously pick one subject to talk about. What one subject does he pick to, to begin talking about things that believers go through? What one subject does he talk about? Trials, difficulties. He's going to talk about what to do when difficulty comes, when troubling circumstances come, when uncomfortable circumstances knock on your door. You didn't invite them. They just invite themselves into 
your house and to your life, and, and they disrupt and, and, and produce turbulence and conflict in your life. That's the very first subject that James is going to talk about. Hello, is it, are y'all listening? To, it's the first subject. Wouldn't it be nice today if we were able to say, I have no idea what James is talking about. I mean, I just, I've never had any difficulty or adversity in my life. Man, my life's been easy peasy, mac and cheesy, like a picnic in the park. Man, my life's been good. So I just sit this one out. Go ahead and preach, Pastor. I'm going to sit this one out because I don't know what he's talking about. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, but that's not the case. One day it'll be the case for a believer. No sorrows, cancer, no tears, no sadness. I don't even know what that's going to be like. I just know it's going to be good. So one day that's coming. But until then, James says, I want to help you with life. I want to help you with some truth that God has given. I, I want to give you, James is, is going to tell us, I want to give you some profound insight about about this, how do you manage adversity in your life? How, how do you work through that in such a way that you don't come out hurt, but come out helped? How, how do you navigate that in such a way where you don't come out bitter by the adversity that provokes you, but better. That's what he's going to share with us. So with that in mind, let's read three verses. James chapter one, verse number two. My brethren, count it, not just joy, all joy, when ye fall into, am I reading too fast for you? Diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh, say it for me. It, it works. What, what do you mean, patience? Endurance. It, strength. Okay? Uh, look up here. When, when God's trying to work the endurance in you, the, the strength in you, don't, don't backtrack. No, no. Let it, let it carry out its course. This is what he says in the next verse. But let patience, it personifies it, have her perfect work, perfect, full. No, 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 no. Look, don't cut it short. If you're not careful, the distress, you'll, you'll cut it short. God, God wants to let it, the adversity, the diverse temptations, have its perfect work, have a full course in your life. And if you're not careful, you'll cut it short. And it won't have its full course. It won't have its perfect work. Which means that you'll be left wanting things in life. Look at it. But let patience have our perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting. Say it for me. I'll wait for you. Man, this is so good. I'll be excited all by myself up here. God says, I, I want to help you navigate adversity in your life in such a way that you'll get to the place where you can say this authentically. I'm good. I don't, I don't need anything to change. I'm good. No way. That's impossible. That's impossible. I don't know what I'm going to say next, so let me go see my notes. Most of the time, I know what I'm going to say. Oh, yeah, this is what I'm going to say. Here's what I've entitled the message this morning. Commanding your conflict. Not commanding the conflict. Commanding your conflict. Yours. 
you command it. That's what I see James saying. Now, I don't see that you see it yet. So we need to do some work here. But I do believe the title conveys exactly what God is telling us to do when we find ourselves dealing with difficult and distressing circumstances. Again, so instead of coming out of that adversity and difficulty, being bitter, we're better. Being hurt, we're helped to the place where we get to the perspective where we can say authentically, I'm good. I don't need any change in my life to be good. I'm good. <laughs> Father, would you, you, you've turned this truth alive in my heart. I'm really excited about it. Sometimes my excitement getting get in the way and I don't want that to happen. So would you help us? Would you help us? Because all of us, all of us that have lived any amount of time in life, we know what it's like to work through adversity. And we have pains and hurts and sorrows and regrets. And sometimes it seems like we can manage those okay. And then sometimes it's like, I don't, I don't want to manage this anymore. I'm, I'm ready to be done. And... I'm not sure where each person is this morning that's under the sound of my voice, but you do. And so we let this, let this truth really have sway in our heart today. We love you, Lord. You're a good God to us. We ask it in Christ's name and everyone said, mm, mm, mm. I can't wait to preach this to you. We say, well, get on with it. I find here in these three verses that we looked at, I didn't even read verse, I didn't even read verse five. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to all men liberally, generously. James gives us three simple steps to follow when we find ourselves being provoked by the adversity of life. The first step is this, command your conflict. Now you don't understand what that means yet, I'll show it to you, but before we get into the steps, we need to do a little study, a little work to understand some of the words and the terminology that God gives us here through James. You'll notice the last two words of verse number two are diverse temptations. I want to spend a few moments just kind of explaining that just to make sure you can see the, the, the beautiful dynamics that God gives. Well, actually not so beautiful dynamics that God gives when he conveys diverse temptations. The Greek word for temptations is parasmas. Parasmas, say that with me, parasmas. Ooh, you did good. It means to be provoked by adversity, to, to be provoked, unsettled, disturbed by adverse things in life. That's what it means. Uh, and, and parasmas is used in the New Testament to describe a whole variety of circumstances. Let me give you just a few so you can understand the flavor of parasmas. It was used to convey this story when the devil was tempting Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism. Do you remember that? 40 days and 40 nights and, and, and the devil parasmased Jesus in that circumstance, distressed him. It's also used to describe those who joyfully hear the word of God and follow the word of God for a short time until parasmas happens in their life. Parasmas. Yeah, if you're going to follow Christ, you're, you're going you're to come head, uh, head on collision with difficulties because now you're going against the grain. You're not going with the direction of the world. You won't go with the direction of the world concerning marriage. You won't go with the direction of the world concerning, concerning uh, 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 fulfilling your desires and, and what you do with your Sundays and, and your work ethic. And so now you're going to begin to go against the grain of the average thinker and the average person out there. And so if you're going to follow Christ, at first it's exciting until you recognize, whoa, if I'm going to do this, parasmos is going to greet me. I'm going to have some tension if I live faithfully 
to serve Christ. And so when parasmos happens, people say, whoa, I don't like this, and I check out. Remember that parable of the four types of ground? Parasmos is used there. When adversity comes, they depart from the word. Parasmos, external adversity. It's also used by Paul. He says, I experienced parasmos from the Jews as I tried to give the gospel out. What kind of parasmos? Oh, like, you know, stones being hurled at me. You know, nothing big. Like being surrounded by a mob and beaten. Ah, you know, nothing, nothing big. Uh, you know, it just kind of makes it hard to stand back up in the morning and, and walk, right? Prosmos. And then it's also, get this one, it's also used to describe people who are rich. And when you're affluent, you have a variety of prosmoses. Now, no, there's rich people in here. I know it. I know there's rich people in here, but you're not going to say amen to what I'm about to say. There's a variety of prosmoses that come your way, right? Because with money comes power. And if it was just as easy as that, it'd be great. But with that money comes more responsibility. You got, you, you got more things that could go wrong because you have more possessions and, and more things. So there's a pressure that comes with, there's a prosmos that comes with being rich not only that, everyone wants a piece of your pie. You don't know if that is that person being friendly to me because they want some of my money? Are, are they trying to get in good with me? I mean, surely that never happens. But it does, doesn't it? And so the Bible uses it to describe those that are affluent and the different adversity that comes specifically because you have money. So, I don't know if you picked up on these four different examples that I gave you. Each one of them is different. One was with Jesus and the devil. One was with Paul and the Jews. One was with uh, speaking of believers and the, as they try to live out their faith or, or professing believers as they try to live out their faith. And then, and then difficulty comes and so they check out. And then one is dealing with those that are affluent and the adversity that comes with that is specific to having money and the pressures and the struggles of, of uh, having money and power and possessions and wealth and so on and so forth. And that leads us to the adjective that James uses for parosmos. Diverse. Manifold. A multitude. It, this word's in the dictionary. Motley. Motley. So guess what I thought of? Come on now. Help me out, my generation. Motley Crew. I just went back and checked it out, man. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that song. Motley, diverse, weird. And if you look at Motley Crew, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy diversity there, huh? Anyway, well, anyway. So, so James calls our attention to the different kinds of adversity we face in life. It could be adversity from a job or adversity from a, a marriage. It could be adversity from friends or from family or from both. It could be adversity from health. It could be adversity from money problems. It could be adversity from Satan harassing you, from a neighbor harassing you, from a dog who harassed you and gave you rage. I mean, I, I'm just saying, it's a whole multitude of adversities, parasmoses, that we're going to experience in life. Yeah, so diverse adversity. Then notice what else James says in verse number two. Count all joy, and then notice the next three words. When ye fall. Huh. Here's how I interpret when you fall. Listen to this. I'm proud of this, so I want you to listen to it. You ready? Here's how I interpret when you fall. The certain uncertainty of adversity. The certain uncertainty of adversity. Let me break that down for you. When, when you fall, certain. Not if, 
when? It's coming. We know that, don't we? Man, if you had a good week, if you've had a good month, if you've had a good year, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful that, man, you're just, you're just on cloud nine and everything's going good and the dog's treating you right and the family's treating you right and the paycheck's coming in and you don't have any problems. I'm just, I'm just enjoy that, enjoy that while that lasts because when is coming. Certain adversity. And then fall. When ye fall. Isn't that interesting that he used falling? He, he used falling. When you trip and fall on, in real life, were you planning on doing that? You, when you tripped, you didn't see it coming. It's uncertain. You know when it's coming. It just came. If you knew it was coming, you would have been more careful, and you would have paid attention to where you're walking, and then you wouldn't have tripped. Eric's here this morning, and uh, his beloved is uh, with their newborn baby at home, I would imagine, and uh, I stopped by your house. I think you were probably still at work. And uh, we dropped off some food. And on my way out of your house, I started to turn around. And their foyer, their entry right into their house, um, it's, it's about, what, three inches elevated from, from the living room. I was right there, and so I turned, and I'm not talking about like a little trip, like I'm talking like almost on my face. And you know when you trip, you like to, especially us men, we like to act like, yeah, I meant to do that. And you like, you, you know, I'm, you know, you just act cool. And I, yeah, I, I got it all under control. Man, there was no fake in this one. It was like almost on my face. I, look. I didn't know that was coming. There was an uncertainty behind that. It was humiliating. And had I known it was coming, I would have looked more carefully. And what God is saying is, look, in life, if you're going to live life, there's going to be things you can be certain that there's going to be things that show up in uncertain ways in your life that catch you off guard, trip you up. And if you knew it was coming, you'd be more prepared but you didn't know it was coming. And you've got to face things like this, parasmos in life. And so James is telling us, you can be certain you'll face uninvited adversity of various kinds at unknowable times that will totally catch you off guard and provoke you in life. Now that we know what James is talking about, Let's look at the three steps he gives to not just successfully make it through the adversity, but to make it through better instead of bitter, helped instead of hurt. Step number one, you want to take a guess? I already told you. You need to command your conflict. Command your conflict. I need to explain this. There's layers to this. So would you let me unpack this? Would you stay with me? This is the most complicated step. I, I, want, I want you to see it from the passage. There's layers here. So let, let's begin to kind of peel away the layers so you can see what I'm talking about. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Okay. The first, uh, the, the passage implies that there are two areas of conflict here. Two areas. I bet you didn't see that when you first read it. There are actually two areas of conflict from, from uh, per, uh, I forgot how to say it, parasmos, two areas. The first is easy to identify. The second is less obvious. The first area of conflict is external conflict. That's the obvious one. It's the source of adversity that comes from outside of you, just like the four examples that I just gave you just a moment ago. Jesus' parasmos came from Satan, that's external. Uh, uh, Paul's 
parasmos came from the Jews, that's external. The rich person's parasmos comes from sources outside, from the different things that are connected to his finances. What was the other example that I gave you? Um, uh, the, the, no, I did that one already. And then the follower, the, the person who's, who believes with joy at first, they think, and then, then external pressures come and they're like, no, I'm checking out. All of that is external. And that's what God is speaking here, that there's some external conflict that comes. And so um, we, we understand that. So, so often our conflict is external. It comes from a job or that person at the job, right? Uh, it comes from an unexpected bill. Like, for example, when your engine stops working and you're a college student, not that I'm mentioning any names, but he's right here. Maybe if you have wisdom in that, you can help this young man, this college student. That'll add some external pressure in life. How do I, it's not like you're rolling in the money. How do, how do I deal with it? Now I don't have a car. It, it could come from people problems. I, I mentioned that already, family members or friends. And sometimes parasmus, the external source of conflict comes from, uh, uh, from health issues that that uh, and, th and then that affects a whole nother slew of things, whether it's finances or uh, different plans or agenda, just all this pressure that comes from outside. But, but here's what I want you to get. The nature of the external sources of conflict, they, they by nature or by default produce another area of conflict that's not external, but internal. And I know that's obvious, but that's what James is pointing out. I'm gonna show that to you here in a minute. And so, External conflict naturally produces conflict in your heart and in your head where, you, where, where now there's this stress over finances. How am I going to cover this? I mean, it can be miserable, can it? That conflict that's up in here, up in here. Sometimes there can be, it can be the internal conflict of heavy psychological weight or maybe fog that comes during kind of heavy seasons at your work or just in life in general, and you've got all these things that have timelines. And you, you, am I the only one, man, when I, I, you know, you go through seasons like that and you have all of that there and then, and, and you have so many things to do in a limited time, you're like, ah, I don't even know where to start. You know what I'm saying? I, I, which, and, and it's almost a paralysis just because you have so much to do and you're like, I, even if I try, I don't feel like I'm going to get it all done. So what's the point of even trying? And so there's this internal conflict and, and then it makes you more foggy. All the weight makes you foggy. And then you're like, man, I can't even think straight. Internal conflict from external conflict. You see what I'm saying? Or, or maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's that internal temperature that begins to elevate with anger, as you are thinking through what that person said or did, you're like, how? I mean, that was external. What that person did is external, but that external conflict produces this internal conflict. You're like, I just can't believe oh, I'm so mad. Internal conflict. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? You, you're staring at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. How about this one? <laughs> You're so frustrated because you thought this was going to work out that way. How, how is it this way? How is it going to do this and that and this? I spent time preparing this and that and this for nothing. None of that can be used now. <gasps> The external conflict produces internal conflict. I have a couple more. Can I do a couple more? Sadness. I mean, deep. Depression sometimes. 
that comes when you feel like I've been trying to do my best, but it, I'm getting nowhere. What's the point? Why well, even try? And that, that depression when you feel like it's all vain, pointless, that's so uncomfortable, isn't it? That conflict. I mean, I could go on and on, but I think you understand the point that when we're provoked by diverse parasmas, that naturally produces a conflict internally. And get this, I want you to get this. It's the internal conflict that James tells you to command. Because you, you can't command the external. You don't have power over that and them. But you do have power over this. And James says, you're going to face adversity that provokes you. It's going to be hard. You can't control that. But if you want to come out better, you have to learn to command the conflict in here and here. And if you don't, you might as well quit. You can read all the books you want. Get all the counselors you want. Get their advice. Get all the resources you can to deal with your... But if you can't command this and this, you're done. You're going to be hurt instead of helped. You're going to be bitter instead of better. Look, that, look at that. Let me show you. Let me show it to you. Verse 2, are you there? My brethren, next two words, please. That's where he says, you command. Count it. Ooh, this is such a good word. Count it joy. We're going to come back to the joy thing. He's going to say, you need to, you need to command the internal conflict to ensure that you have the right perspective. One of joy. What do you mean joy? Well, it means that you're convinced it's going to work out okay. And that's why you can be joyful. All joy. We're going to get back to that in a minute. I want to get back to count it. What does that mean? It means command. It means command the internal thoughts, the internal mind. And, and James is saying, get this, James is saying, don't let how you feel dictate your perspective. Don't do that. That's natural. Don't do that. You have to command the internal feelings and thoughts. The Greek word for count is very interesting. Hegomai. Oh, yeah, there's point number one. Hegomai. My pronunciation of that probably lacks the proper emphasis. That's okay. That's the Greek word for count it. Are you still with me? In the Bible, there's a Greek word used that's translated lead, to lead, to lead. It's called ago, ago. It's this word, ago. It means to lead someone or something, to lead. But James didn't use a go. He uses hegomai, which also means to lead, but it has a much different forcefulness to it. If you understood grammar, hagomai is in the imperative. Does that tell you anything? For those that know maybe grammar, it tells you something. But if you're like me and you don't know what that means and you have to read what others say, uh, then let me help you. Imperative tense is used to show something that is demanded or required. It's a demanded action to be performed. And so the imperative 
of Hegome is uh, this is an expectation. This is not a request. This is something that you have to do forcefully. You have to command it. <laughs> it's, it's so good. So let me illustrate. Let me, illust- oh, by the way, let me give you the definition. To lead forcefully with commanding authority. To lead forcefully with commanding authority. I think we need to illustrate this. Let me paint a picture in your mind to illustrate the difference between ago and hegomai. A toddler is given a new toy by mama, new present. But it's not a toy that uh, little Johnny wants. And so, like most kids, you know when they don't like a toy. (laughs) It's obvious in their attitude. And so, you as a mom, you pick up on this what they're saying without saying it just by their, dis- you pick up on it uh, very early and you could tell little Johnny doesn't like this gift. And uh, so you as a mother, you hand the toy to the kid and you say, now little Johnny, you should always be thankful, always be thankful, always be thankful. Well, how does a child respond? They don't care what you think, mom. They only care how they feel about this stupid toy that is a waste of money that you just got for them. And, and so the mother, you as a mother, see the great disdain on the face of the kid. And so, so the mother speaks back up and says, okay, little Johnny. Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you. And so what does the kid do? It looks at it and the kid just drops it. Drops the toy, it's on the ground there. Can you see it on the ground? You're not looking at it on the ground, it's on the ground right there. And the kid's like. And so now you see my kid's got a bad attitude and I'm trying to train him to be thankful so he didn't do this as an adult. When his wife or husband, anyway, uh, when 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 the spouse gives a gift and you're like, honey, this gift stinks. No, that's not a good way to respond. And so you're trying to train that out of him. And so you say, okay, little Johnny, now let's pick up that toy, okay? Let's, let's have a good attitude. Let's have, okay, okay, you need to pick up that toy now, okay? Right. Now, go ahead. Y- yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead and pick up that. Come on, little. Okay, let's, one. Uh, I'm counting. One, two, three. Little, little Johnny, come on. That's how I go. That's how I go. You're trying to lead the kid. But that's not Hegomai. Can I show you the same scenario, Hegomai? Oh, no. You you didn't just drop that, did you, little Johnny? Oh, you're going to pick that up. And mom places her fingers on the trapezius of little Johnny and applies pressure and twists and says, you're gonna pick up that toy, little Johnny. And the kid all of a sudden has motivation through pain to do what mama says, picks up the toy, now say thank you, say thank you. That's Hegelman. You forcefully command what you expect. That's what James is doing here. I, I want to read what I wrote here because I was very precise and I, I want you to get what James is saying. James is telling us how to successfully manage the unexpected an uninvited adversity of life that provokes you. And the first thing, the first thing he tells you to do is you have to have command over the conflict, not the external conflict. You can't control that, but you do have power over the internal conflict that goes on in your head and in your heart. Get this. And you will either allow yourself to be commanded by your emotions 
or you will determine, no, I will have command over my emotions. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can change your sadness to happiness. You don't have control over that to some degree either. What it means to have command over your sadness, over your disappointment, over your anger, over your frustration, over uh, any negative feeling or thought is you say, okay, I recognize that you're there. I can't change that. But what I do plan on changing is how you determine to control me. And you're not going to control me. You're not going to control my perspective. I'm going to have command over you. I can't erase you, but I can ensure that you don't command me. I will have command over how you are trying to influence my perspective over this adversity. This is in the Bible, folks. It's in the Bible. And the fact that God says you forcefully have command over your feelings indicates that it's possible for the brethren. For the brethren. How are we doing so far? I have more here. Okay, look. James isn't diminishing the reality of your pain. He's trying to help you. So when your feelings and thoughts are filled with distress and frustration and irritability and anger and sorrow and sadness, they naturally show up in your head and in your heart because of the external conflict. You must determine to have command over how these things affect your perspective and you have to forcefully lead your perspective to this, all joy. You don't have to feel joyful to have command over the perspective, this is all joy. Please get that. It doesn't mean that you wipe away the distress, the frustration, the anger, the disappointment, the pain and sorrow. You can't do that. Don't you wish you could? We got a bunch of medications that people try to do that. We got a bunch of methods that humanity uses to try to do that, alcohol and drugs and and fulfilling desires and all that does is pack it away for a few moments only to bring it back where it continues to diminish you and that doesn't help but what will help is where you acknowledge okay life st- i feel like life stinks right now i feel that way but what i refuse to do is even though i feel this way to let this dictate my perspective i'm going to count it as all joy mm. i'm going to count it as something that is going to be used for good, that's how I'm going to count it. Step number one, about how to navigate your adversity. You have to have command over your conflict. Command over your conflict. I'm about to get you step number two, but after hearing step number one, you might say, well, that sounds all nice and buttery and flowery and ooey gooey and tasty and sugary and sweet, but uh, I mean, how do you actually do that? Well, that's where step two comes in. Look at verse three. First two words. Look up here. Step number two shows you how you can. It's based on what you know. It's what you know. What you know is different than how you feel. So here's step two. Reflect on what you know. Who's James talking to here? What's the first word in verse number two? Uh, I'll come back to this, but he's not talking to a believer. Uh, I'm sorry, he's not talking to an unbeliever. What an unbeliever knows is drastically different than what a believer knows. I'm, I'm gonna close with that. Look up here. You're a professing believer. 
I know you, I know you have adversity, and I know the conflict that it produced on the inside is real, and it's uncomfortable, and it's unexpected, and you wish you could change it. I know that. I know that. You have to determine not to let that control you. You have to have command. How do I do that? It's based on what you profess to know about God. Look what he says. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. We already hit this, but let patience have its perfect work. Don't let, don't cut God short in what he wants to do through this difficulty. Let it have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. He's talking to believers. He's talking to people who claim, get this, he's talking to people who claim to believe in God Almighty that has all control over everything. That if he wants something to stop, he can just make it stop. If he wants waters to split, he can make waters to split. If he wants a virgin to somehow miraculously be with child, he can, she can miraculously be with child. If he wants to resurrect someone four days after rotting for four days, he can do that. He's talking about brethren who know these things about God. And how you can have command over your perspective rather than your feelings commanding your perspective is all based on what you profess to know about God. Has God demonstrated that he can take a nasty, hurtful, harmful, traumatic circumstance and use it for good? Has God, has God give us examples of that? I have some notes, but let's take some votes from the floor. Give me some names of people that have been in the Bible, that have been through some really nasty, painful things that you wouldn't even want to go through, and God ended up using it for good. Give me some names. Joseph sold out by his family, his brothers sold him for money. They were gonna kill him, but they sold him for money. Ended up in jail for years, over 10 years being forsaken by his family, left for dead as a slave, forgotten and mistreated. Over 10 years. Did God use that for good? Without the good, he would have never been in front of Pharaoh. This is what you claim to know about God. Give me someone else. Jer Jeremiah, how about we go with Job? I don't want to be Job. I want the faith of Job. Please, please. Don't kill Naya, Nason, and Nolan, God. Don't allow Satan to kill him. Let me say it that way. I don't want that. But we know how it worked out. Did it work out for good? Talk to me. Yes, is there anyone else that we have besides uh, uh, Job and uh, Joseph? Does I have to start with a J? David. David running for his life. Look, it started off so well, slew the Goliath, and he's 18, 19, 20 years old. Took him out. Everyone's like, man, you're amazing. Everyone's singing this song. David killed, uh, Saul killed his thousands, and David killed his tens of thousands. David, you're the man. You're going to be the next king. And then he goes on the run for 15 years, running for his own life, and thought about suicide. If you know the whole story. How'd that work out for David? How'd it work out? I think it worked out pretty good. Ended up being the king, writing one of the most encouraging books in all of the Bible, the book of Psalms. I'm pretty sure it worked out for good. I've never had to run for 15 years from my life from someone I helped and invested. I saved his life and he tried to kill me. I've never had to do that. Give, give me something else. Huh? Jesus is a perfect example. The worst, experience the worst of it. Get this, so bad. The, the pain, the adversity, 
so bad for Jesus that he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Praise the Lord for it. He let patience have its perfect work. And now I am eternally entire wanting. Yes, dealing with emotions is really hard. Hardest thing you'll face in life. But if you know God, you know he can take the worst and make it good? So what you do, here's the steps. You acknowledge that you have some really uncomfortable circumstances, not just on the outside, but on the inside, and that you're miserable. But because of what James says, you forcefully command that how you feel won't dictate your perspective. And you say, I'm going to be okay. I don't feel okay, but I'm going to be okay. And then from there, you go from there, whether you, look, you don't feel like doing that. What motivates you to do that is not, what motivates you to do that? It's not how you feel, it's how you know. And then you go from there and you say, okay, I'm not gonna let my anger dictate my behavior or my perspective on this outcome and my pain. And, and I, I refuse to let them command me. I will have command over how they dictate me. And I, I'm going to render them as, as though they're real, they don't reflect reality. And the reason I can do that is based on what I know of God, that he can take the worst of circumstances and use it for good. I just have to let God run its course in, in time. And his course is gonna be different than mine. His timing is gonna be different than mine. I just have to give God time to do it. And so God, I'm commanding how I feel based on what I know you can do to the worst of circumstances. I'm convinced of it. So you reflect on what you know. And then the third thing, the final thing. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. I can't give you the third thing yet. This is so good. I came across this Saturday. Saturday, what's today? Of course it's Sunday, gracious sakes. We think I'm an idiot or what? What number day is it? Yesterday was 24. I read this. I, re I don't always read the the proverb that corresponds to the number of the day, but yesterday I did. A wise man is strong, yea, a man of what? Increases strength. Now I want you to get this. Do you know what God equates true strength to? Not your physical prowess, not your ability. It's this. What you know, that strength. Says the wisest man ever to walk outside of Jesus. Your strength is not your money. Your strength is, is, is not your discipline. Your strength is based on what you know. Solomon said that. And so for the believer who knows God, there's no reason your emotions should have command over you. Now, step number three. Look to God for direction. I know that's so basic, but that's where verse, that's where verse five comes in. Look at it. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay, look, look here. We often use this verse and, and we strip it out of its context. And, and it is true that this text applies to any time and any circumstance, right? You can ask God for wisdom at any time. You don't have to be in a distressing circumstance. You don't have to have adversity in your life. 
But this text is given and this promise about asking God and he'll give you wisdom. This is specifically given with the thought of a person being in the midst of a distressing time and they're trying to command the conflict internally so they can have the right perspective based on what they know. That's what this, and, and doesn't that make sense? Let him ask God because look, when you're hammered by life and by the difficulties and by difficult people and finances and all the problems and all the adversity and you're hammered by that, it's so overwhelming and your mind gets foggy and you're like, I, I don't even know what to do anymore. What do I do? (laughs) Can I tell you what you don't do? Don't rant on social media and ask for an opinion, please. For please don't do that. Foolish. The verse didn't say. Seek social media, and God will give you an answer. And we laugh at that, but don't, don't we do that oftentimes? Don't. You go to God. You say, God, this is how I feel. I've done my best to command the conflict on the inside, not let how I feel dictate. And I've reflected on what I know about you, that you're going to use this for good, though I don't feel like it at the time. But God, I don't know what to do. Could you help me? God said, if you do that, I'll lead you through. I'll get you through. I'll get you through. And that's how you do it. It's that simple. And when you when you feel like you've already done that and and now you're facing another difficulty, another adversity, parasmos, what do you do? Well, you repeat the process over and over and over and over. I have two more things to, closing things to share with you, but I I wanna tell you a story right quick. Many of you know I, uh, I love endurance activities, and uh, I've done rem to rem to rem three different times. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. My fastest time was 12 hours and 20 minutes. There's no way I could do that today. I, age has severely affected me. Do you know what gets endurance athletes through to the finish line? Do you, do you know what it is? It is not this. Though this can help temporarily. You're too old to be drinking monster. It's not in there, it's water. Oh, it's water. You funny guy. Okay, all right, let's bring this back. Man, I love having fun in church. Don't you love having fun in church? Yeah. Okay, this is, this is how an endurance athlete makes it through. I'm getting there. See, an endurance athlete will have various moments when his body feels like junk. He'll have moments where his body says, don't you put another drop of food in that mouth. And, and literally, the gag reflex, look, you have to eat, otherwise you're not going to finish. But the gag reflex from the body is so strong that literally you have to choke through gagging. And so what an endurance athlete will do is he'll feel horrible. He'll like, man, I, I can't believe I feel this horrible. But the only thing I want to do is sit down. But he knows he has to keep taking in nourishment. And so he forcefully swallows to down that nourishment. He forcefully does that. And he does that because he knows if he doesn't, it only gets worse. He, know, he does that, but get this, he does that because he knows that if I do this, though I feel miserable at the time, if I, if I go by how I feel, I won't put nourishment in. But the reason I have force over how I feel and I force food down my mouth is because if I don't, I'll never finish. I know that. 
And so I need this even though I don't feel like I need it, even though my body says, that is disgusting. Spit that out. I force it down based on what I know will get me across the finish line. I'm telling you, there, when I've done rim to rim to rim, somewhere around mile, somewhere around like mile 18, I get so nauseous. I'm so nauseous, but I, I refuse to listen to myself and I've made it every time based on what I know and life is that way. Life will make you nauseous. God, God knows it hurts. He knows. That's why he's giving you this plan. Command the conflict. Reflect on what you know about me and my ability. And then when you're confused, because you will be, come to me. By the way, you, how, how do you look to God for direction? I'm gonna give you three quick things. One, you get in the word of God yourself. Two, you be where the word of God is, church. Number three, you have to have godly counselors, godly counselors. Not friends on Facebook, not friends on Instagram, godly counselors. People that you know walk with God. People that you know will look you in the eyeball and say, your thinking right now is stupid and you need to change it. That's how you get God's perspective. Now, my two closing thoughts. Um, Luke, come to the piano, would you please, buddy? Okay, first closing thought is quick. Your ability to do this and this completely hinges on this. If you won't command this and this, if you don't command that, you won't take time to reflect on God. You won't nor will you ask God for help. You have to command the conflict. And you can do it because the Holy Ghost is inside of you if you're a believer and he can equip you. Amen? You can do it. And you've got believers that'll help you. You need someone that you can call and just say, I'm a mess right now. Can I just spill my guts? And they won't judge you for it. I feel like quitting. I want to quit God. I want to quit church. I want to quit my friends. I want to quit my family. And you just spill your guts and they're going to be there and say, it's understandable. Now let's command how you, let's command the conflict on the inside. If you can't do number one, you won't do number two. Now, the last thing, the last thing is this. This was given to brethren, to believers. Your ability to command the conflict internally is always based on what you know. Always. So if you don't know the great God and Lord Jesus Christ, by what are you going to command your conflict with? What knowledge? Well, if it's not God, then you only have one source. And that's what man knows. I, I, literally, what, do you, what, I mean, what other source? That's all you have is man. Well, that's a pretty dismal way to live. We've got a lot of years of history of mankind. We're still struggling with the same issues. We still got chaos on the earth. We still got poverty on the earth. We still murders like crazy. Violence. Sexual aggression. Like crazy. We haven't figured that out yet. We're still talking about wars. We're still talking about wars. We, we haven't figured that out. You're, my point is that for the believer, the believer's ability to command the conflict is based on what he knows, the great God that's sovereign over everything. But if you don't know God or if you don't even believe in God, 
What a sorry way to live. Then, then you base your conflict, your ability to command the conflict on what you know, on what man knows. You know where that leads you to? The grave. And what's after that? I mean, I know what I believe at what's after that, but what's after that for you? So if you happen to be one of the unfortunate souls that goes through a lot of adversity, more so than the other, why not just end it now? I mean, seriously. I'm just trying to paint the picture that God gives for the unbeliever. It's dismal. And based on what God says, your conflict will lead you to the grave, but that's not the end. You'll have to stand before God and give an account of your life, give an account of all your sin, your lies, the wicked thoughts that you've thought. And he's going to judge every one of them because he's just, he's perfect. He can't, he, he can't be unjust. So if he's going to be just, he has to judge your sin because he, because he's just and righteous. And the person who's guilty of sin, the Bible says they'll have to suffer the consequences and that's eternally separated from God forever in the lake of fire. So even if your life was amazing on this side, what's the point? I mean, I mean seriously, how, how are you gonna command the conflict of life? It's based on what you know. Here's what I would tell you. If you're an unbeliever, here's what you need to do. You need to know that God is going to judge every sin, but he doesn't wanna judge your sin. Are you listening to me? He, he loves you. He died for you. So you wouldn't have to stand before his judgment. And he gave his son who sacrificed his life to pay for your sin. He loves you. And he wants to take the same victory. Get this, I'm almost done. The same victory that he gave to Joseph and his difficulty and Job and his difficulty and Esther and her difficulty and Naomi and her difficulty and David and on down the line. And he wants to give that to you. So even while you go through some of the worst chaos on this side of life, you can base your perspective on what you know, that you have a sovereign God that's ultimately in control. And even if life on this side is filled with difficulty, man, you're just a few breaths away from eternal hope and forgiveness. And you can have that by acknowledging that you're a sinner and asking Jesus to save you. The Bible says he died to pay for your sins. If I were you, I wouldn't live this side of life trying to navigate the conflict based on what I know. What a small way to live. You can be saved today by acknowledging that you're a sinner, asking him to save you, saying, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please save me. And he'll do that just like that. Just like that. Just like that. Because you're going to have to go through difficulty with or without him. Lord, I come before you today. It's a somber passage. Somber. But I'm so thankful that you, you give hope. You give us this plan to navigate our difficulty. Please, please help us to follow these steps, please, over and over and over and over again. Would you do that? Would you do that? We ask it in Christ's name, amen. I want to ask if, if you're a believer, here's what I would ask from you today. I, th I think it'd be a good day for you to come before God and you say, God, would you help me to be better at commanding the conflict internally? Help me to be better at not letting how I feel dictate my perspective and my direction in life. Uh, every believer ought to pray that because it's a hard thing, isn't it? It's a hard thing. Would you do that this morning? Come on, don't be stale, don't be unresponsive. You respond to God and say, God, oh, please, please help me. And then maybe for you that are uncertain about God, this passage shows us that God loves us 
and has given us every tool we need to navigate the most difficult of circumstances. He loves you. And I'd plead with you that you'd call upon Christ, ask him to save you. You don't have to acknowledge all of your sins. You can't do that. You just acknowledge that you are a sinner and that Jesus died for your sins. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just a simple prayer in your heart. God, I don't know the best way to say it, but I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me because you love me. Would you save me right now? You can do that right now. And it'll come into your heart, give you eternal life. Then you can start living based on what you know of God, not what you know of man. Brother Rick, you sing. This would be our time to respond.